I'm going to be presenting a series of studies um, that's based on the UCLA early intervention that um, Dr. McCracken spoke about earlier. This is um, the origins of our JASPER treatment here at UCLA. So. Um, before I can start, I need to acknowledge um, my wonderful mentors, Dr. Connie Casary, the PI on the projects I'll be presenting, um, Drs. Uh, Paparella and Freeman, who were in charge of my clinical training way back when, um, and Dr. Hellman, who's been working with me on the, on the stats portion of this pr presentation. And of course, a special thank you to the families, some of which are in the room here today, who've participated in these ongoing randomized control trials with us at UCLA. So to overview what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to present very quickly already published data. So you can go to those um, publications and look in further detail about the results. Um, and then I'm going to spend the most time looking longitudinally at these kids at a five-year follow-up time point, where we looked at did treatment matter longitudinally for these children when we randomized them to specific treatments, short-term treatments, and then followed them. And we're particularly interested in the effects on language development, as well as developmental trajectories of early core deficits, things like joint attention, symbolic play. So I think most of it, us in the room can now agree that early prelinguistic skills are important to both concurrent and, and later expressive language in children. Prelinguistic skills, things like nonverbal forms of communication, joint attention, very important to language development in our kids with ASD. And most of us incorporate them as teaching targets now in early intervention. So that's, that's a good movement that has been made in the past decade. Um, but we don't really know enough about how these skills that we target early on really affect the developmental trajectory of our children over time. So we initiated a study way back in 1998, um, a randomized control trial. And this is the published work, so I'm going to just blaze through this, these couple of slides, um, where we randomized children to one of three treatments, joint attention treatment, symbolic play, or a control condition. All three groups were receiving 30 hours of ABA on top of this intensive treatment. So it was controlled for. Um, the intervention was short term. I want to emphasize this because I think the results are pretty spectacular for a treatment that was only five to six weeks in duration when the child was a preschooler. And this was delivered every day. Um, so first, I'm going to show you a summary slide of essentially what I'm going to consider the more proximal outcomes, joint attention, play, language, I, over the first year of development in these children who are randomized to treatment. And then I'm going to elaborate on the five-year follow-up data point. So you can see that both our joint attention and symbolic play treatment groups increased over a year's development in initiating joint attention over and above the control, play level, as well as expressive language development. And this ended up being about, they gained about 15 to 16 months, um, if you think about language age, as compared to seven months for the control condition. Um, we also found an effect by, by treatment in that children who had the lowest expressive language age when they, when they were randomized did the best in terms of, terms of their overall language development when they were randomized to the joint attention condition. So something about joint attention does seem to be affecting later language development in these children. That's one year later? Yes, one year later. How long were the sessions? The sessions were 30 minutes a day for five to six weeks. Okay, very you know, intensive but short term and actually not that much time when you really think about the numbers. When you think about ABA is 30 hours a week often. So we found benefits to a focused content on joint attention and play in early intervention. And we know that these improvements were uh, translated to better expressive language one year later. But we really have very limited data in the field about long-term long effects of early intervention experiences. What happens after children receive intensive intervention? Um, most early intervention studies that are well published and cited report limited to even no follow-up data on these kids. So we at UCLA wanted to do better. And we saw these kids five years later. And we, with a specific um, interest in what is the long-term effect of this small treatment when they were preschoolers on later language outcomes. Um, so we were interested in spoken language outcomes. 
who, who gained expressive language, who didn't? And then of those who gained expressive language, what was the predictors of their degree of language ability um, at eight to nine years of age? That would be five years after these three to four year olds were randomized. So to describe this um, sample, 40 of the original 58 children came back five years later, which is pretty remarkable. They're great families, really good, really dedicated. Um, and an equal percentage returned from each treatment group, so we didn't have to deal with more from one treatment or less from the control coming back. 80% um, of the sample, so 32 out of the 40, achieved what we considered functional usage of language. And for, the, and for these purposes, that was being able to basal and, and actually um, achieve a score on the expressive vocabulary test. Um, and just because I know I have a lot of people in the field that are kind of interested in where these kids ended up, an overwhelming amount of them were, were, were mainstreamed. Um, five were mainstreamed or in regular education with absolutely zero support services. Um, 17 were in regular education settings with some minimal pullout support, maybe for social skills, speech therapy. And 18 were in a special education program. Yes, Dan. Yeah, I'm just to clarify, um, yeah. obviously there's kind of a comparison group within the study. Yeah. But if you just think about generally what's out in the literature, how does this compare to children who don't get, you know, who just get, you know, whatever happens in the community? Because five out of forty, you know, is around 11, 12 percent. That that may not be so different than. Uh, yeah, so really the question was more, where are those kids at that point? Like, wh where, what's their school placement? And that actually wasn't the main focus of our study, but it was just a piece of descriptive information so we could understand how many of them were in regular education settings versus special education placements. So, um, so you don't think that that's a, an outcome or you're not... It's a descriptive outcome, but we didn't actually look at it in the analysis. We looked at um, that language development, which I'll actually present right now. Um, so looking at predictors of what we considered functional usage of language. So we looked at all 40 children, and we wanted to know what, what predicted their, their group membership and like a logistic regression, right? What children went on to gain that expressive language and which ones con continued to, or, or were functionally nonverbal. And the single best predictor of that was baseline play level um, of these children. So when they came on into us at three to four years of age, those children who were playing at what we consider presentation combination play, and that's jargon in my, in my world, what that means is essentially being able to put together a puzzle or put together a shape sorter at three to four years of age, that was very predictive of their ability to um, be in that group that, that gained language, as opposed to children who played at more what we call discriminant acts, which are just kind of basic, simple, single acts on objects at three to four years of age. Then we looked at, for the 32 children who did develop expressive language, what predicted that the degree of ability in their expressive language. And um, this is where I think that it's one of the more surprising, interesting results is that, well, we know from um, early intervention work that the earlier the age of entry into the study, the better they did long-term in expressive language. So reiterating early intervention, emphasis on the early is important. Um, the amount of initiating joint attention was very important to later language development. Play level, how high, well, how complicated, were they playing at a higher combination or even a pre-symbolic or symbolic level of play? But also what snuck in there, which I think is really amazing, is treatment. So the early treatment that we did, the, either the joint attention and play, uh, the joint attention and symbolic play treatment assignments both predicted expressive language over and above that control group. And what ended, how this translates when we looked at this, um, it's about a one standard deviation score above the mean, above the mean um, for the children who received the treatment. So about 10 to 12 um, standard scores above the control group in expressive language. So that was amazing for us because we understood now that the child's level of play really was the single best predictor of, youth, of functional language in these young kids when we followed them over time. But we also found that chronological age, initiating joint attention, play, treatment, all significantly predicted the degree of expressive language in those children who went on to gain, gain, gain language ability. 
But what was important for us, we wanted to push this even further. And so this is, that, that paper just came out in JCAP 2012, if you're interested in looking. But this is now new data I'm going to present. Because what we really wanted to know now is we wanted to push this a little bit further. Since what we did is we looked at predictors of expressive language from, from entry. Now we wanted to know, we had repeated measures of these kids across time in terms of their joint attention, their play ability, their language ability. We wanted to go ahead and look at developmental trajectories over time of these children and really understand what influences the growth of these constructs over time. So we wanted to characterize, I just said this, um, so the growth trajectories of joint attention, play, and also global measures of DQ, IQ, language over that si same five year period. Um, and we were particularly interested at look, in looking at this two ways. We looked at this first by diagnostic outcome at follow-up. So we had three groups of children at outcome. Um, one group who met full criteria for autistic disorder, continued to meet full criteria, one group that met for ASD, an autism spectrum disorder, and the last group that actually didn't meet diagnostic criteria anymore. It was definitely a smaller group, but we were interested to, in kind of a comparative fashion to see is, is the growth of their skills different than the groups that you know, had the diagno diagnosis of autism at follow-up. We also looked at these constructs by treatment group again, and I'll present that. So the, the, the slide I'm going to show you, the next two slides I'm going to show you are actually using um, growth modeling, mixed modeling, and looking over time. And what we did is we, we scaled the the x-axis by chronological age to better interpret essentially the amount of skill at each age, three, four, five, all the way up to nine years of age in these children. And so what you can see is the first, um, the first graph shows expressive language. And overall, all children improved in their ability to use expressive language over time, which is good. Um, there were no flat trajectories. But these two groups, this is your kids who no longer met criteria for an ASD, as well as your ASD children, both had significantly steeper trajectories over time in their expressive language compared to your group of children who had autistic disorder. And that's not completely surprising. Um, we also looked at the developmental quotient of these children. And again, here's these three diagnostic groups over time. And again, you find that um, you know, our autistic group has you know, a, overall a lower trajectory over time than our other two diagnostic groups, or no diagnosis and, and ASD groups. Then, what I think is more unique, um, we looked at specific joint attention skills um, in these children. And we wanted to know what's the course of these skills over time. And there's actually no good work, or actually none I could find, that shows what happens to joint attention in children across time. Um, and you can see that two skills here, both coordinated looking, so the ability to you know, share attention through eye contact, look at the object, look at an adult, look back at the object, as well as the joint attention uh, skill of showing. I bring something up and I hold it up and I look at you and it's, and it's to convey that I want to share this experience with you. Both of those joint attention skills seem to continue to increase over the developmental period. And in fact, it was very interesting that our group that had the no autism diagnosis actually had the, the steepest trajectory in both of these developmental skills. Um, and this was obviously the interaction was significant, this compared to both of the other groups. So something about you know, being able to do these skills was important you know, for essentially diagnostic outcome um, you know, down the road. Then something interesting happened, and we looked at two other skills, and we found almost the exact opposite pattern. We found that some skills over time seem to decrease. Um, and so that leads to a whole range of speculation, and, and I'm interested in kind of hearing your thoughts on this, and I'll tell you mine. Um, but the, the joint attention point seemed to increase for the first couple years of measurement, and then there was a really dramatic decrease in the amount of pointing. And 
if any of you, you know, kind of are thinking about what this means and, oh my goodness, I teach pointing to my children, uh, you know, what's this outcome? I think it's, it's not as bad as it seems. I think what's happening here is that we, as you're teaching joint attention and you're teaching ways to non-verbally communicate, what's happening is at about five to nine years of age, there's a shift from using non-verbal gestures to doing what? Talking, right? Do adults point? Really? That much? No. So there's probably just a developmental shift here in the ability. So children are using more nonverbal gestures in preschool, and that's shifting later on. And it's essentially just becoming less, it's becoming de-emphasized in development over time. But the next graph, um, which looked at mother-child toy play, I think something different's happening here. Um, and can anyone guess what you think's happening with this particular measure over time? So child, all children in all three diagnostic groups are increasing in their level of play with their mothers over time uh, in, during preschool age. And then it just continues to, to decrease in, to eight, seven, eight, nine years of age. What could be happening? It's sad for me as a mother of two boys, but they don't want to play with their mothers anymore. <laughs> I think that's what this proves, um, you know, that this measure became completely irrelevant at later time points. And it's important for us to think about this in the developmental framework when we're thinking about following these children longitudinally. It might not be important to do a measure like this. What's more important is to get measures of social adjustment, school, <laughs> friendship, which we also did report on in these children. And, you know, we're in the process of looking at that data. So just to wrap up, we also looked at this by treatment status. And what was interesting about this is that um, you know, the joint attention group, so the children that received that joint attention, short-term intensive intervention early on, those were the children with the steepest trajectories in coordinated joint looking and showing. Okay, and the steepest trajectory in expressive language development over time. So again, reiterating the importance of, the, of emphasizing joint attention, nonverbal communication skills, and early interventions of children with autism. So to summarize, early, and I say early because chronological age was so important, um, targeting joint attention and play really can have lasting effects on child development even five years later, which we find very, very remarkable in our data. Um, and we think that specific developmental skills may become de-emphasized, such as the point, um, but others seem to be increasingly important across the developmental period. So although it might be hard to get a child to, to show in the preschool ages, and it's actually quite a hard skill to teach as well since I do this, it's very, very important that that child starts to develop that skill and continues to do that um, for their overall you know, development. Um, and that we know that these development tra trajectories are influenced by both diagnostic status and treatment assignment. And just as a note, these two, diagnostic status and treatment assignment, were not completely mutually exclusive in that there was a trend towards children in the joint attention treatment were, ch were, were more likely to lose diagnostic status um, at the follow-up. So just to wrap up, in, uh, just because I can't, say it talk without showing these cute, cute kids. Um, I want to show you one of our rock star children in our joint attention treatment. And I just want to emphasize how important a change, how tangible it is, how remarkable these kids can do in early intervention. What do you think this picture's about? What do you think this picture's Summer. about? Summertime, yeah. Like a, like a vacation. I think it's the first day of summer. The first day everybody's out. Do you like to swim? Yeah. Yeah. Are you a good swimmer? Yeah. Do you like to play tennis? I do. I do. I love to play basketball. Do you like basketball? If you look like it, you were good at basketball. <laughs> So, I mean, isn't that just the sweetest? I mean, that co eye, coordinated eye contact, the you know, conversation he was able to maintain, um, you know, the joint attention, the, you know, the shared experience there, that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. And so um, I'm really excited to be able to do this work. So thank you so much. Thank you.